La Rochelle, 40 points to three winners against Bayonne, second in the table, game in hand against Toulouse. Given the COVID situation you, com you have come out of, that is very satisfactory, I would think. Uh, yeah, it is, but we've uh, bigger games ahead, obviously, with all respect to, to Bayonne. We have uh, hopefully Toulouse, but I think there could be cases of uh, COVID in Toulouse, so we're not too sure about that. That's disappointing when you go hard at it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then potentially at the end of a session on a Wednesday, you hear that they're, uh, they have potential cases. So does the game go ahead? Because obviously... Uh, these are the reasons you're involved in, in rugby for weeks like this, but playing Toulouse at home. Uh, obviously, there'd be no supporters then. Uh, away to Racing in a rearranged game, away to Toulon, um, the following week at home to Stade Francais. So it's um, it's going to reach boiling point quite mm. soon. Okay. And that Toulouse game was meant to be this weekend, or is meant to be this weekend? Sorry, it is this weekend. It, it is. is this okay, weekend, yeah. but it was just a few little whispers out from... from from players, I think they have a few contacts, like a lot of people in, in other dressing rooms. So I think they've had one case for definite, but hopefully it is only one case. Yes, absolutely. And at your end then, so I know you had various positive cases in La Rochelle. Has everybody come through it OK? And I, I don't just mean, you know, out of you know danger of it or out of hospital or anything like that. I just mean general energy levels back, fitness back, or have, have people been hit hard by it? Uh, yeah, people are hit hard, yeah. Uh, everyone is very different and there's no, I suppose, common trends emerging from a rugby point of view. It's um, some guys, you know, I mean, tested positive over two weeks ago, but they wouldn't be reintegrated into the group. They're, I think the common consensus seems to be that they all um, find the first even light jog extremely difficult and but quickly kind of get it back between, you know, in sessions two, three, four, five. Uh, but... Um, an awful lot of people um, are, are struggling. Are struggling with it. The guys who have tested positive have um, their feedback is just um, it's not a nice thing to get. No, I'm sure. Did you catch Munster Leinster over the weekend? I did. I did. I watched it. Yeah, I watched it. Um, yeah, my reception was incredibly frustrating because I, I need Wi-Fi to watch games over here and. Um, Surprisingly, this work works very well, but when I try and watch TV, unfortunately, it um, it pauses when you don't want it to pause <laughs> and jumps. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but you do. I did see the last ten minutes when Monster were behind, and and I could see that the box kick in was still there, which was disappointing in terms of uh, chasing a game like that. I, you know, what I mean, I suppose the thing is that when you're behind. You at least have to look to see if your winger is going to chase the kick. It just seemed that they gave the ball to, to Leinster too easily at the end. But then the flip side of it is that Leinster showed uh, immense quality in why they are a championship team. They played pretty averagely, but uh, they got one or two opportunities and the Ross Byrne kick was, um, was brilliant. Yeah, maybe actually you're the man to ask. A lot of people were uh, complimentary of the technique Byrne used on that kick. What was good about it? I actually thought uh, initially uh, going to bed, I didn't realise. I, I presumed it was a ricochet and the ball bounced through. And then when I watched it again, um, I realised that he threaded it. It was kind of, he had one in a hundred probably opportunities of doing that and to get it through like that. Um, so obviously that skill is a lot easier left to right for right for the kicker. So because you're, you're running an arc and you kind of leave the ball inside your foot and you you, you just basically uh you know what i mean it's down a little bit from um from your big toes where you're looking to to, to kick it mm -hmm. and you're looking to get the arc but the bounce uh you know that if you commit to the kick even in a short space of, tur of short space of um of grass the ball would bounce up for for the recipient and uh mind you uh hugo keenan did, did exceptionally well and his offload pass was um was toulouse-esque hmm. he's winning lots of plaudits on munster generally and then i do want to ask you about yeah the, he is he, and rightly so yeah. he's he's, he, he's i think he's he's pa he's taken every i suppose you have to forget how uh inexperienced he is but every challenge put to him he's excelled and he looks like there's more in the tank and, and and that's great to see young guys i suppose getting that up sorry a guy like him taking his opportunity but also probably in whatever way he has done it showing he has more to offer mm. 
On Munster generally, there's a sense that they really could have won that game. There's also a sense, though, that they are closing the gap somewhat on Leinster. I wonder to what extent do you think they are closing the gap on Leinster? Yeah, that's a, just a, a fair question. I think, um, you know, we do talk about small margins and it's 10-3 after, you know, I mean, 40.10 on the, on the, on the match clock. Uh, uh, JJ has a kick, a goal, hits it really well. Um, you mean, uh, you flip it around and, and Leinster go in 13-3 if, 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 if you're looking at it from a psychological point of view, it's that that's what happens when you have confidence, I suppose, right throughout your team. Munster haven't had that feeling for a number of years. Uh, so not alone was it 10-3 at halftime. It was 10-6. It could have been 13-3, which uh, is a very, very different game, Joe, and the fact that, you know, on a worst-case scenario, you, you, you give up a try. It's 10-all. It's a draw. That's all right. But, like... Going in from from that position to ten six, it just means that okay, if we give up a try here, it's game over. In the fact that sorry, they go ahead, mm. it's not game over. But it just it, mentally, it just play plays on your mind in terms of where the where the off sideline is and how you can kind of uh, cheat with good intent in a game in terms of you know what I mean just really pushing that off sideline from a defensive point of view. Um, so, um. I think um, Munster were, managed the game very, very well. They started exceptionally well, and, and they, it was a very physical game for the first half an hour. A lot of uh, big collisions, a lot of big hits, um, and Robbie Henshaw was to the fore. He, I thought he was, had an excellent game. Um, but yeah, I think if, when you, I suppose, break it down and you look at it in its, its pieces and parts, that there, there was definitely. Uh, a lot of progress ma made by Munster, but I think with the quality of players they have there, they you know what I mean they'd be disappointed that they didn't kick on to win the game. Mm, okay, and even could, against such quality, is Leinster, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is there anything in particular that Munster are doing better now that they weren't necessarily doing, say, a year ago? Um, I, yeah, I think they are doing a lot of a lot of. You can see. Like how they started the game, I think, you know what I mean? Like Chris Farr was acting as a pivot. They were playing a little bit more width. The rock ball was a little bit quicker. They were changing the point of of attack a little bit quicker. CJ, you know what I mean, has added a, a little bit of, uh, I suppose, um, variation in the fact that in the past with Munster, you would always presume he's there to carry, carry, carry. But now he's actually scanning to see where the space is. And I think... Uh, with their skill levels, the boys were able to put the ball into space. So uh, there is there is progress. You've got to remember it's a January night, and you won't see the best of the rugby probably till till March or April. Mm. Okay, well we'll watch that space. Andy Farrell was uh, speaking today. It was the Six Nations launch. You never got roped into one of those launch days, did you, for Six Nations? Um, no, in my day, though, it was the coach and captain you score to. Yeah. Um, I think was it well, London, I, London? I think yeah, a long day by all accounts, one to be dodged. Oh, I don't know about that. You're going, you're going as the captain of your country, Joe. That's the other way of looking well, at it. It's true. It's nicer to captain your country in a match, though, not sitting around doing interviews all day. But yeah, anyway. but like that's the other side that people don't understand. You know what I mean? That that's the eighty minutes. But I think uh, the the bigger picture is a small part of your life and it's something that you should absolutely grasp with both hands and it's a massive honour. So yeah. um, I think it's sometimes, you, you know, you, you kind of forget the privilege it is. Yeah, that's a fair point. I wouldn't be recommending you turn down the captaincy on account of no. what you do this day. No, <laughs> that would like, <laughs> how bad, you know what I mean? Well, exactly, well, you're right, okay. Yeah. You get on the plane, you can have a cup of tea, a little bit of a snooze, you get driven to your... To do it, but yeah, you said roll back and you asked me that as a player, and I would have been exactly like you. Yeah, so. exactly. This is the thing; you'd have been cussing uh, the whole way to the. Oh, thing. <laughs> be sure, man. <laughs> Grumpy head me and yeah. narky with the journalists. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. So Andy Farrell talking today, and he reiterated the sense um, that I, well, I think that everyone has, and he said as much back in autumn that England and France are admittedly the teams to beat. He said we're not that far off them. We're not that far off England and France. So England and France. Come to Dublin. I know you don't have team sheets in front of you and injuries and all that stuff will happen. But England and France coming to Dublin, would you expect England and France this year to win in Dublin or no? 
Uh, I think um, it was probably a 50-50 game. I think, sorry, the French game, because it's the second game. The Wales game will either be an absolute uh, massive um, positive or a very um, low, I think, uh, psychological blow, depending on how that game goes. And obviously the yeah. momentum feeds into it because it's, you play on a Sunday and you're back into action the following Saturday. Or no, Sunday again, is it? Yeah, I think it's I think. Sunday, Sunday, yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, you know, in that regard, um, are they facing into a training week with, with a, a pep in their step? Or is it, oh, this is a hugely pressurised game all mm. of a sudden? I think the massive positive for them is that uh, France do not have a centre like Fatakawa to replace Fatakawa or anyone in that ballpark. So right. with him not in the back line, it's a very different French team, I feel. Mm. Yeah, you're, you're probably right to bring in the Cardiff game first off. That will dictate so much. Can you imagine how tough the schedule looks if you lose in Cardiff? Well, you know, like the, the, you also have to, I suppose, tease that out with the fact that how hard it is to win away in the Six Nations yeah. too. yeah. And the record there, I, I'm not too sure how it is, but I wouldn't think it's it's overwhelming in favour of Ireland. No. Well, you know, I mean, obviously we can't be guided too much by history because that doesn't really apply nowadays. And the fact that it's, you know, I mean, if you're looking at a percentage over 100 years, you're probably it'd be more accurate to look at the last, you know, 10 years or whatever it is. Um, but like uh, Wales are, is a camp that's under pressure, but you have to be so wary of a wounded Welsh side and this is the game that they'll be targeting for a number of months and this is the game they have to come out firing in. So it's um, it, it, it's a crucial game and, and that's, I suppose, we always say that as players when you played for Ireland, the fact of trying to get momentum in the Six Nations, you have, you know what I mean, two teams that are top of the table after round one and they're extremely happy where they are. Um, and there are, sorry, there's three teams, but all, other than that, um it, it, it's it's um, it's so important, obviously, to get off to that to to, to that start. Mm. You've sidestepped my question beautifully, by the way. Go on, remind me again what it was because France, England, Dublin at the outset. Would you have them favourites for both <laughs> games? I just want to know. My sense would be Ireland, France is probably fifty-one, forty-nine, maybe fifty-fifty game in Dublin, Ireland, France, and then I'd be fearful still of England coming to Dublin. But who knows? So I'm curious as to what you think. Yeah, I would be too. I think England are better than than the other teams in, in the Six Nations at the minute. Mm. Um, but. They are at the minute, but you play for the 80 minutes that you're tested on. And I think with the experience and the quality in the Irish team, um, would it surprise me Ireland winning in Dublin? No, not at all. But if you were to kind of, I suppose, try to break it down with a little bit of uh, logical sense, uh, England have a very settled team, a very experienced team, but also uh, so many really top players playing at the top of their game I suppose Ireland um, see is for me there's a, probably a little bit of uh, youthful exuberance missing from the sea, from the team at the minute mm. Well to be fair to you as well the England game is last game out so so much will change between now and then I was just curious to get your overall thoughts at the outset a 36 man squad named by Andy Farrell by the way if we're looking for some youthful exuberance coming through interesting to see Craig Casey get the nod along with Murray and Gibson Parks and no Luke McGrath no John Cooney Marmion out as well uh, that would really suggest that they and Caelan played yeah yeah, a lot, of, a, lot, a, a lot, lot of good of players shots. yes yeah so like that, that speaks volumes about how they see Casey then uh, for me, not necessarily. My my reading it was, it's Murray to start and Gibson Park to add impact, and I think Craig Casey to 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 get a feel of what international camp okay. is like and the step up from Heineken Cup. I could be wrong. Would you, would you, would you, your sense is, if if say Murray and Gibson Park got struck down, they might be calling in someone else as opposed to playing Casey. Um, I wouldn't be shy of playing of of playing them. I think. Um, Every, you know, he's a little bit like uh, Hugo Keenan and the fact that I think the opportunities um, he's been given, he's excelled in and he looks um, like he likes a challenge, I suppose. 
his last 10 minutes in the Munster Leinster game uh, didn't do him um, any favours, but I would say that was adhering to, to the game plan in terms of uh, this is what we do, but it's probably not what we do when we're three points down. Mm. But that's mm. how is he to know? He's grossly inexperienced and he'll be so much better for that. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? Learning in, in the fact that the next time he gets that, he, I, I'm sure he, his decision making will be a little bit different. We had Liam Toland on the other evening and he just made an interesting point about the out-half situation and uh, Johnny Sexton actually is going to be on the show on Friday so it'll be great to hear from him. But obviously he's getting to an age and uh, the World Cup is still two years away and Liam Toland was making the point and I'm kind of curious to see if you agree with this. He said, he, he, you know, let's assume it's going to be difficult for Johnny to, to make it to 2023. Hopefully he surprises everyone and is still playing great then. But Liam Toland was saying, really, at World Cup level, you would like a starting number 10 who has 50, 5 test matches under his belt. You know, ideal. Yeah, well, you won't have that, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, we won't. So we're not going to. Like, Ross Byrne has 11, and then beneath them, the likes of uh, Healy or Harry Byrne, etc., uh, aren't anywhere close. So I was going to ask you, wait, wait, how many tests before you felt you would have been kind of really motoring at test level? Um... Yeah, I, I think uh, I I think that twenty to fifty bracket is very different to the kind of zero to five. Obviously, it's a blur. Five to ten you caps, you're kind of yeah, I can do this. And then ten to twenty, okay, I either uh, kick on or I get kind of pushed aside. Mm. Um, but I think you know, I mean, once you get to that stage, it's obviously that you're of international. Uh, capacity and capabilities. It's very, very obvious for me that uh, the key man in all this, I think, is is Joey Carberry because he actually changes. Then, I suppose the potential for 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 uh, for Johnny's role and the fact that I think without Joey, there's a huge onus on on Johnny and a huge responsibility on Johnny to start games and do 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 everything nearly but the fact that if Joey was there Johnny can easily play the backup role and, and, and play and have as much impact in 30 minutes than he could have yes. in the 50 or 60 minutes yeah. so it's a very very different dynamic and it's a one that could be very interesting and I think it also tactically changes the um, the situation as well but also the fact that if Joey finds a strides then there's a capacity to bring in uh, you know what I mean a Ross Byrne or a Harry Byrne or uh, um, a, another player to to get up to speed with, with with Johnny in the background as well. But like, um, you know, it's it's so um, you know, I me mean, talking about it. I suppose doesn't uh, when you're that player and you've that burning desire to be such a competitor and play for your country, and you know that it's won't last forever you, you know what I mean Johnny isn't going to isn't going to walk away he's not going to kind of um, underestimate what what um, how much he brings to it and, and how much uh, rightly so he feels that that not playing for Ireland would be such a big void for him yeah and he's and he, I guess he's dead right to because the interesting thing is Andy Farrell has about 26 matches to play with until the World Cup you know when you put it in those terms it's nothing and on the you know like he's got to balance building for that World Cup, not least at out half, with the fact that, look, the knives will be out if it's not going well. Like, would you would you expect if, if Andy Farrell blooded new out half that he'd be forgiven for losing Six Nations matches? I, I'm not so sure he would. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very difficult, sorry, scenario, I, th I think, for him, because as a coach, you'd be weighing up those decisions too, because you need short-term results for the confidence of the group and mm. the best opportunity for me for the for short-term results is obviously Johnny Sexton he's he's on a different I suppose level to to the other tens in the squad but you know I me mean? he'd be 36 in the summer uh so that you know at that age I don't think you continue to improve and it gets very very hard in the body so um there will be decisions there but at the minute um there, there, there isn't, uh, you know what I mean, for example, Joey Carberry is not there, so these decisions aren't available to Andy Farrell at the minute. Mm. Yeah, not easy. It's going to be really interesting to see how it all plays out. Obviously, Carberry can change everything. 
the other option is is what they do in the southern hemisphere is that they just uh, you know I mean France do it to a bit they kind of look at World Cup cycles and they go okay uh, you mean he won't be there for the World Cup this is who we're going with and you kind of have Entomac and you have Carbonell now and you have mm. um, Jalibert so you have three guys probably in their very early 20s and um, that that's how they're building their team so there's different ways of doing it mm, mm. Listen we're out of time thanks so much for all that Ron Nagara cheers Thank you Joe see ya cheers Take a break with News Talk. Here's Eddie Murphy, clinical psychologist. I want you to stop and think about connecting with others. The power of friendship is so important. It is the antidote to loneliness and isolation. Friendship.